My name is Eric Hiram, and I'm one of the technical assistance providers for the main options program. Uh, and I'm very proud and pleased to uh, be working with all of the liaisons, recovery coaches, their employing organizations, and the different stakeholder groups that they interact with. Uh, this afternoon, we've got two panels. Uh, our first panel is going to be from Penobscot County and uh, our second panel from the York County region. Uh, and, and what we're trying to illustrate with these two panels is how partnering with your options liaisons in your communities uh, can improve response time and improve outcomes and in fact uh, help save lives um, as we all grapple with the ongoing uh, problems with opioid and substance use related overdose and overdose death. Um, so a little bit about OPTIONS. Uh, OPTIONS is an acronym. It stands for Overdose Prevention Through Intensive Outreach and Naloxone Safety. Um, what it is is substance use disorder clinicians, licensed clinicians, um, as co-responders embedded and uh, heavily partnered with first responding agencies. Um, you, you probably have heard this throughout the course of different trainings and breakouts and discussions today, but nationally about 75% of referrals to substance use disorder treatment services come from the judiciary and law enforcement. Um, and so it's a pretty logical place for the options programs and liaisons to be connected to where about 75% of the referral base comes from. Uh, and I know that there can be some criticism around that because we want to be inclusive of the full range of different stakeholder groups in all of our communities. What you'll see with the two panels this afternoon is uh, diverse stakeholder groups that have knitted themselves together to be able to respond to very, very complex situations, cases, and needs, uh, and ultimately improve the response time and, in fact, the outcomes. So more on options, right? Again, you have embedded liaisons with first responder agencies, co-responding to overdose and other SUD-related emergencies, connections to recovery coaches, and this year, adding recovery coach positions in all of the option county liaison regions, right? And ongoing uh, technical assistance. Myself, Oliver Bray Dean, uh, Amy Carter, we meet with liaisons uh, as groups and as individuals and help problem solve barriers that they interact with in the community uh, and spread facilitators or things that work so that other people can learn and we can accelerate those improvements. Community-based partnerships for low barrier access such as syringe service programs, recovery resources or clubhouses, education and connection to local harm reduction services, recovery capital gains, community coalitions, hospitals, hospital emergency departments, med surge floors, county jails, all very logical places for these connections and relationships. So primary responsibilities, as you can see, uh, post overdose follow-up, connecting people to other services in our continuum of care, such as the main mom network and programs, helping people get main care applications or other benefits and entitlements, uh, community engagement, we, we track a lot of data from this program at the individual client level so we can learn what's working and what's not working and where it's working and where it's not working. Connections to federally qualified health centers and other providers, um, naloxone distribution and community training, harm reduction support, uh, professional assessments and referrals to treatment, Lots and lots of education to community members around stigma and bias and racism. Resources, navigation, and barrier removal. So some key metrics to date. So looking back from when we started in 2020 through last month, the end of June, 
right? There's been 4,909 co response or post overdose follow ups statewide conducted alongside those first responding partners. 4,400 clients referred to community based treatment programs. 4,700 individuals referred to community based recovery support programs. 14,000 individuals trained in overdose and anti stigma education. And nearly 20,000, 19,000 doses of naloxone distributed. And, and that's in part to the work that you're going to see from the liaisons and their really key partnerships uh, that you'll meet. Now, what they're going to do is they're going to talk a little bit about how they organize themselves in their own community to improve response. And then each of the panels has a, a de-identified case, a real-life client that they interacted with as a response team. Uh, to help that person access services that ultimately resulted in them still being with us today. Um, and the point here is that all of the stakeholder groups that you'll see in these two panels exist in each county. The opportunity to replicate these response efforts is very, very high. Uh, and what we'd like you to do is, is go back to your communities and do that. Um, Everybody got uh, hopefully handed out this little trifold as we started walking in this afternoon. Uh, information in here, how to get to know your county liaison, um, how to make referrals, uh, and we've canned some questions in here for you to consider when you go back to your communities. Do you have a go-to list for resources about harm reduction, recovery supports, and treatment in your community? Who's the option liaison in your county, and how can you connect with them? What services and resources for substance use disorders do my local hospitals provide? What pathways does the local emergency department use to help people for substance-related emergencies? Those are good questions for members of the public to be thinking about, and in fact, to know the answers to. Uh, and so a part of what we've done with front loading the talk with these things for you is because we want you to go back and find out the answers to those things in each of your communities. And if you don't like the answers, interact with those stakeholder groups and let them know what you need. Okay. And so with that, I'm going to turn this over to our first panel from Penobscot County. And Ashley Roberts, who is uh, the liaison in the Bangor area, is going to introduce the group and walk us through uh, their case. Hi, so I am Ashley Roberts. I am the Penobscot County Options Liaison employed through CHCS. And I have been a drug and alcohol counselor uh, for a few years, working with the Options Program about three years now. Uh, so in Penobscot County and Piscataquis County, uh, we have a very unique situation in that when Options was first started, we have a co-grant with Bangor Public Health that was started at the same time. And so not only did they start Options, but they also formed an overdose response team, which Megan and myself are part of. Um, so that has brought us a few bonuses. So that gives us um, a few members of the Bangor Police Department that have chosen to be on our team. We have our favorite one here today. This is Officer Alvarado. Um, it has also given us the benefit that we have had recovery coaches as part of our team since day one of options. And so I will turn it over to Pat, our recovery coach, and let him introduce the rest of the team for you. Hi, my name's Pat Keeley. I am the certified peer recovery coach with the Penobscot County Overdose Response Team slash options. I am also a certified intentional peer support specialist based out of the Together Place on 2nd Street in Bangor. It's a great little place. You should come down and check us out sometime, right? <laughs> um, I am a person in long-term recovery. I am formally incarcerated. I've been out on the streets. I am also the holder of several problematic mental health diagnoses myself. Right? Um, 
my job is to get out and connect with people on the street and also to connect with our law enforcement partners, right? Um, I, I am going to introduce the rest of the panel right now. We've got Amy West. She's a family uh, nurse practitioner, the associate medical director of substance use disorder for PCHC. We got Jessica Taylor, senior director of population health and care transitions, St. Joseph's in Bangor, Maine. And we have Megan Harrigan, who is our second options liaison and covers Piscataquis County. Be handing it over to Megan right now. Hello. Today we're here to chat with you guys about why we made this whole team kind of happen. <clears throat> Ashley and I had been going out in the community in Bangor and we were meeting with folks uh, responding to non-fatal overdoses with PD and we were also um, connecting with our people to maybe get to detox or a recovery pathway that met their needs and, <clears throat> sorry, and we were also going out one to two times a week, building relationships with folks and just getting to know them. They were getting to know us and just giving out, you know, supplies, Narcan, all that stuff. And that amount of time that we were doing that, we noticed that people were having really high needs medical issues and not being able to make it to their appointments and or to a clinic or emergency department, half because there were a lot of barriers from where they're maybe houseless outside to getting there uh, were too many steps. The second half was their experience that they've had in the hospitals, in the clinics, because of their active use and how they were treated. Why do you want to keep going back? Um, so what that ended up looking like were a lot of folks with lots of medical needs, untreated, out in a community that maybe they weren't getting their basic needs met. Therefore, it was making their medical conditions a lot worse than what if we had been able to treat at the very beginning. So through a lot of networking, talking to a whole bunch of people, and um, putting together a medical outreach team, because that's what we needed on the other end of Ashley and myself. We needed medical folks to come out so we could say, this is where we are, this is what we're doing. We need to do it in the spot the person is right now, wherever they are. So we were able to focus on meeting medical needs in the community and um, putting a different experience for our folks who are living out there to meet with medical people and have a different um, outcome while they're being treated and then being followed up, you know, with people that they were connecting with along the way. And now it's your turn. Thank you very much. Um, I am French and I talk with my hands. So I don't want to stab one of my counterparts okay. with the microphone. So I'm actually going to probably go up to the yeah. podium if that's okay. Perfect. All right. It's for your own safety. You're welcome. All right. Can you hear me okay? I'm also a little vertically challenged, so I'll try to see you over the podium while I'm talking. All right. So um, my name is Jessica Taylor, and I am the Senior Director of Population Health and Care Transitions at St. Joseph's Hospital in Bangor, Maine, and I am so excited to share with you the positive outcomes that we have realized with this partnership and how grateful I am that the options team have allowed me to come out with them and learn from them and, uh, and have all their little uh, pearls of wisdom to help to inform the care that we are giving to this such a vulnerable population. And, but before I do that, I wanted to just take a moment and just kind of call out what I've seen as a pattern here today and specifically what Megan and Ashley were speaking to and, and Amy will speak to as well, is the, the real benefit when dealing in, with uh, vulnerable populations in our community, the real benefit to that population is really creating those relationships, not just with the patients, but with your other community partners. There's a lot of great work that's happening out in the community, but if we are not connected and we are functioning in silos, it's not as meaningful to the patient and it's not patient-centered. So I'm coming at this from a hospital perspective because that's where I work, as a hospital. And by the time patients come to me or get to the emergency room at the hospital, they are so sick 
they are very far into whatever ex exacerbation that they're having. They have other chronic diseases as well, you know, that's making that exacerbation worse. And they have delayed their care for many different reasons. One might be out of fear. The other stigma, we have a long way to go in the healthcare system when it comes to stigma. And again, that's another benefit of having these partnerships so they can teach us and they can help us to receive folks in a much more compassionate way. The other, the other issue is they may delay care because of lack of access to care. The care's not there when they need it. And so that you know, very important having that timely care before things get really far down the road, and that's what Amy will speak to when she speaks and the value of her role. You know, again, so from a hospital perspective, when we're waiting for folks to just show up in our emergency room, that's very reactive care. We're reacting to the person coming to our building in the condition that they already are in. So how do we switch that from a proactive approach to a reactive approach? in getting out there to seeing folks, um, sorry, reactive approach to a proactive approach where we're helping to prevent folks from getting very, very sick. You know, how do you do that when you're in a hospital? You're in the hospital, you're kind of stuck there. What we had to do is we had to look at ways to collaborate in our community and move the healthcare out of the brick and mortar of the hospital and into the community with the people that needed the help so that way we could reach them before they got really sick and to create those relationships that are so important. You know, again, um, the, the magic happens with the options team and with Amy and, and the officer over there. They're doing the boots on the ground. They're the folks that have the relationships with those folks and, and the work that they're doing. And we're just seeing them in a little snippet in time. So those relationships are really important to ensure that the care is, is, is holistic. Each team brings their own skill set to the table. You know, and Megan touched on that a bit when she spoke about identifying the need for the medical piece to it as well. So again, creating those relationships with your partners in the community are very important to the patient to make sure that they have the care that they need and that's appropriate. But it also helps to switch the view of our healthcare system, again, from a building like it always has been, a doctor's office or a hospital. But switching that view out of the building and into the community, again, as I mentioned, out of that brick and mortar, so that healthcare does not become a locus or a place, but rather a continuum. So healthcare is what's happening with that person at that point in time, where they're located and when they need it. There's lots of studies out there that show that those when vulnerable populations come into the hospital and they've already waited a long time to seek care, the outcomes are not good. They're sick, they're higher, they have a higher mortality rate, they have a, a higher um, you know, rate of morbidity, and they have a higher length of stay, higher you know, amount of ED visits for ambulatory care sensitive conditions. That's stuff that can be taken care of out in the community. And so that, that taxes the healthcare system and it's a limited resource. We want to make sure, to make sure it's there for when folks need it and um, you know, can access it. So what, did, what, did, what have we seen so far with this collaboration from a hospital perspective? It's just been a short amount of time, but I will tell you we have seen some wonderful things um, you know, implementing what you know, I have been taught from the options team and, and Amy um, in the hospital and changing our lens and, and perspective of how we're treating care. How are we discharging people back out to the community? Because you know, we all know that there is a perfect scenario, best practice, and a perfect world we'd have this. This is reality. And I think all of us have to you know, meet in that intersect there to make sure that we're providing you know, great care. Prior to this collaboration, our discharge planning was speculation. I mean, we would talk to patients and we would try to learn what was happening with them, but it was really based on what our perception was, not what was meaningful for them. And so with this collaboration, they have the wonderful advocates that can help to inform their discharge plan and to help to advocate for them and to call us before they come in and say, hey, you know, this person's coming to you, this is what's going on with them. Um, I'm also able to see folks out in the community when I'm going out um, with the teams and then see them in the hospital for that warm hand up and that friendly face. So again, it's that creating that continuum you know, for, for care um, to make sure that the care is passionate and patient-centered. 
So I'll stop talking because I'm a talker, so others get to talk. But before I do, I'll leave you with one thing. I would invite all of you, every single one of you, to go back into your communities and see if there's a partner or someone that you can partner with that's giving great care. It doesn't have to be huge bells and whistles. I think we connected because we picked up the phone and called each other and said, hey, do you mind if I come out and see the great work that you're doing so I can learn from you? I invite every single one of you to do that, and that's really what's going to help to make the care a little bit more patient-centered and create that continuum. Thank you. the podium too because like Jess I talk with my hands and the microphone would be everywhere and no one would know what I'm saying so um, I'm Amy West and I became part of this team when I was working in a low barrier MOUD clinic uh, on a pretty main drag in Boston, uh, Bangor Boston was a while ago in Bangor and I was seeing a lot of patients that were really high risk for overdose but I was seeing them walk by my office <laughs> instead of coming in for their actual visit so understandably, a lot of those patients that were really high risk for overdose and death weren't making it into me regularly, if at all. But I would watch them walk by my window on their way to the shopping plaza, often within about 10 to 15 minutes of when they were supposed to see me. And then a couple hours later, I'd see them walk back by. Um, and I knew that there was an encampment right close to my office. And it started to feel a little ridiculous that I was sitting here twiddling my thumbs, watching people walk back and forth when I knew where they were. And not just one of my patients, but a chunk of my patients, many of my patients, and understanding that their priority that day wasn't coming in to talk to me and giving me a urine. It was, how do I eat? How do I stay safe? Uh, how do I not feel sick? So it seemed wild that I was expecting them to know what day it is, what time it was, and be a priority for them when it really, I wasn't. Um, and realized I need to go to them. Um, in my background, I worked in medical outreach in Boston and knew that my success as a provider and providing medical care was only as good as the community partner that I was working with. These folks don't know me. They don't trust me. Um, and they needed somebody that they trusted and that they knew their intentions were pure. And Options was literally the perfect fit for that. Um, I had worked with Ashley at PCHC before she was on the Options team. And Ashley had outreached us to just be aware of what Options was offering, what they were doing. So I called Ashley and said, hey, while you guys are doing outreach, could I come with you and maybe provide some medical support? And they were like, medical support? <laughs> we need medical support. So that's kind of how it all started. And over the past couple of years, because of the work that they did in the community, knowing where patients were, knowing what the needs were, how to meet the needs, who the other community partners were, we were able to grow not just our nuclear team, but kind of the spokes of the wheel, knowing who else in the community was seeing our patients and the day-to-day, -day, and them having a way to connect with us when they noticed a patient needed, uh, needed something. So for instance, you know, the director of the Bangor Public Library might call me or call Ashley if somebody, or Megan, if somebody needs something. Pat may see someone at uh, the recovery center and we can all communicate with each other and come up with a concrete plan just for the day, the week, the long-term plan for those individuals to make sure that their needs are met with the long-term goal of engaging them in recovery treatment, which we have had great success with, um, but also keeping them out of the hospital um, and keeping them alive, frankly. So it takes a village, and I think we've created that for our, for our patients. Thanks. So to quickly kind of round off our panel, I want to give you guys a real life example of how we use this and how this team is so important and how we come together. Um, so mind you, on a typical outreach day, we could see anywhere from 10 to 20 patients in five or six hours, okay? And this is just one of those people, okay, that we see. So there was a person who identified as male in their early 20s who, was, who is diabetic, co-occurring mental health and substance use disorder, and chronic homelessness. He was living in a vehicle or a tent with his long-term partner who also had significant mental health and substance use disorder. Uh, there were concerns for domestic violence, exploitation, um, or trafficking by the 
partner by towards the male. Um, options and Amy West started seeing him for v medical visits. Uh, we saw him for medical visits for about a year on a weekly basis, whether that be diabetes or a wound or whatever the need was that day, we would see him at the encampment. Um, after about seeing him weekly for a year, um, he lived in his tent all winter and he got frostbite on both of his feet and had to have all his toes amputated. Uh, he did have this done in a hospital, obviously, and he chose after his surgery to return to his tent against medical device. Um, he also did not engage with any medical follow-up, um, which how do you blame him? He doesn't have a phone, he doesn't have a car, he now has a very hard time walking. Um, and so we started seeing him again. We said, hey, he's back in his tent, we're gonna start seeing you. By that time, Jess was also coming out with us. Um, and so, we started doing wound care on his amputated toes in his tent in the middle of winter in a homeless encampment. Um, and we encouraged him to go to, back to the hospital. We called ambulances. We had him even in the back of an ambulance one time and his partner was able to convince him not to go. And so we continued this for a while and um, Jess was able to meet him on outreach. So she'd come with us, she would help Amy do his wound care, they would have conversations and they started to build a, get to know each other. Um, after four months of these weekly visits, wound care in the middle of winter in a tent, he did go back to the hospital. Um, Jess already knew him, she had already formed a, you know, a relationship with the patient. She was able to connect him immediately with all the care that he needed. So she knew he had these wounds. She knew his medical conditions. She was able to get him proper treatment for his infected wounds, his active substance use, and his diabetes. Working with Jess at St. Joe's, they were able to keep him in the hospital, transition him to a medical rehab, and then further coordinate for him to come to Southern Maine to live with his family again. And I wish he was here so he would know how proud we are of him, that he is still living in Southern Maine, he is in recovery and he is cleared of all infections at this point. Um, and so this is just one of the many examples of things that we've run into, why this team is so important and why you know, we want other communities to also take this on. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. Thank you. Let's hear it again for Penobscot County. Okay, now I'm going to call up our panel from York County. This is going to be led by Lacey Bailey, who's the options liaison in uh, York County. And put up your slide. And like this first panel, what you'll hear is um, how they got themselves organized to improve response and a case that they will walk you through. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out to hear us um, learn more about the options program and what we're doing in each community around the state. Um, as mentioned before, there is a liaison um, or multiple liaisons in every county around the state. Um, I came into this work about two and a half years ago, February 2022. Um, I have a long history of working in social work in general, substance use, um, mental health. I am a woman in long-term recovery myself, um, a wife, a mother, a recovery ally advocate uh, to people who use drugs. And it's really an honor today to talk to you about um, kind of where it started and where it's gone. Uh, so when they first said, you know, you have this position and we're gonna put you with Sanford Police Department, which I have Shannon Bentley here today, who is the mental health first responder for Sanford Police Department. I didn't really know what I was doing or how I was supposed to do it. They just said, here's a county, go do the work. <laughs> um, and so, that led to some challenges, lots of lessons, um, but I've been really honored to be a part of a police department that really supported what I was doing uh, in the work and really letting me try to come in and to offer services versus maybe take somebody to jail, uh, stabilize on scene when possible. 
uh, divert from the ER or when the ER was necessary, be able to advocate for that person to get the services, which I think in this role I found was a lot harder than I thought it would be. Um, and so uh, that will be more explained in the case that we're going to present. I'm going to let each person on the panel just introduce um, who they are and what their role is um, under their title and who they work for. And uh, so I have Shannon Bentley from Sanford Police Department, Aaron McGann from Sweetser, who was crisis during the case we're gonna present, but is now also in options liaison in York County with me, and Marsha Thomas, who's the intensive case manager inside York County Jail. Uh, we also had Todd Prevet, who's the intensive forensic case manager for Office of Behavioral Health, uh, who also had a pivotal role in here, but um, is lucky enough to be in Las Vegas gambling with his uh, buddies as a yearly trip, so I couldn't really blame him for wanting to go there, but I will explain his role and how he, um, how he really helps this case. So I'm gonna hand it to Shannon. Is this on? <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm Shannon Bentley. I'm the mental health first responder, like Lacey said, with Sanford Police Department. I'm hired directly through the police department, whereas Lacey is contracted through options. We share an office space um, in the PD with two other officers who are um, assigned to our mental health unit and work as a team to respond to mental health, substance use, homelessness calls um, for service in the moment. And then we do a lot of follow-up work after the fact. Um, Lacey and I both have uh, like long-standing clients that we work with in the community. Um, I would say our roles are pretty similar. Um, do a lot of education for the police officers and how to respond to mental health emergencies, substance use emergencies, overdose, stigma. Um, we do a lot of work building partnerships in the community, which is what this is all about. So this is Erin. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Erin McGann. I also work for Sweetser. Um, in my role here, I worked at the crisis um, unit, or the crisis department. I was embedded in the York Hospital, um, and we'll be talking to you a little bit about that. My background is 20 years in uh, criminal justice in Texas. And when I started there, I was a parole officer, and the vast majority of my clients did have substance use issues. And my answer to that was, just stop using meth. I'm sure you can guess exactly how many of my clients listen to me. If you guess zero, you would be absolutely right, and I've learned a lot since then, but I still think that if they'd all stopped using math, their lives would have been better. Just saying. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Masha Thomas. I uh, work for the state of Maine, Office of Behavioral Health. You met our fearless uh, director this morning in opening remarks, Director Squirrel. Uh, I work for uh, the Justice and Health team. Uh, if you're not familiar with what an ICM is, Intensive Case Manager, uh, they're located in all the county jails. Uh, they're located at uh, the state prison in Wyndham and also at the IMHU. And we also have intensive case managers at the both state hospitals, Riverview and Dorothea Dix up in Bangor. Uh, my job is when an individual who's been out in the community gets involved in, in doing some crimes, <laughs> I hear from either Lacey or Shannon that uh, they're, they're on their way and is gonna be booked at the, at the jail. That gives me an opportunity to go down and meet the individual and um, learn a little bit about them and about their history and follow them through their case. I work, you know, with their defense attorney. I sit on the uh, uh, York County Mental Health Court, um, and so, and I do reentry planning, and um, that's about what my role is. Thank you. Um, so the case that we're uh, that we're going to present to you today, we all know very well. Um, it's been a very long road um, with this client, so I'm going to give you some background. This is a 32-year-old male, uh, primary diagnosis a schizoaffective uh, disorder, bipolar type, uh, secondary diagnosis of um, an opioid use disorder, severe stimulant use disorder, uh, and those things together make a very challenging um, person to work with, however, um, also lovely, um, very sweet kid. Um, has, you know, lots of uh, trauma background, 
very paranoid in the way that thinking that other entities, mafia, they, them, the police, um, were out to kill him. And so it was very sometimes complex when we would come across him and he really just thought people were out to get him. Um, he often would also be vulnerable to sexual exploitation uh, by way of trying to get some of his survival needs met um, and ending up in those vulnerable situations. Chronic homelessness, very high utilizer of police services. When I came in and met him in February 2022, he was actually my very first client with options. He had had 40 plus intakes to just the hospital in our local area that year. Um, just in and out, you know, sometimes every 24 hours. And so when I went in, this was an individual that just to me was clearly struggling and clearly sick and clearly needed more than he was getting. And so I thought I was just gonna walk into that emergency room and be like, this is what this person needs. And it was not easy. Um, that led us to about six different uh, hospitals in Southern Maine before we would actually get a crisis worker that was listening to what we had to say and give this gentleman a shot um, at, a better, at a better life. Um, and we knew that he needed a very um, high level of care and that is always not the easiest thing to access and that was one of my biggest lessons in the very beginning of this. So kind of my role with him is I, and I thank my uh, supervisor Alyssa for, um, I think I needed some supervision around this quite a lot and I was feeling really defeated and like we're not getting anywhere and how are we gonna get him this, this help and she reminded me of what I, what I was doing and that was being a lifeline for him. And so even though it didn't feel like we were getting very far. That really stuck with me because no matter where he was, barefoot in a subway, three towns away, uh, with one of my officers out in the woods somewhere, on a stranger's phone, I was the person he called. Um, when he was in crisis, when things were going wrong, when he was in another town and might be coming across a different um, set of law enforcement, he would say, call her, um, and I would be able to offer some information and try to help guide him uh, more so to a hospital than uh, to incarceration. So again, six different hospitals, feeling really defeated, kind of trying to take a new perspective, uh, doing a lot of harm reduction with him, and we ended up at York Hospital, uh, which is where Aaron came in. And uh, Aaron also works for Sweetser, so we were you know, kind of already part of the same team, but to have somebody listen to what was going on, to understand his behaviors, to not let them get in the way before somebody treated him like a person was just instrumental. Um, and so I'd like Erin to just explain kind of her interaction with this individual uh, and, and where that went after she assessed and met with him. So um, this client wasn't necessarily somebody that every crisis worker would think, oh gosh, they need to go inpatient. Um, he was having a lot of delusions and hallucinations and, um, and substance use issues. And lots of times people will dismiss that as, oh, it's just substance use, just send them back out, they're fine. Uh, he clearly wasn't fine. And he was willing to talk to me, which is always amazing when somebody's having those kinds of delusions. Um, I'm not like, special in getting somebody to talk to me. I didn't do anything special except that I listened to him. I let him talk about what he thought was going on. Just because I don't see, you know, the the think people he sees or hear the voices that he hears doesn't mean that they're not happening for him. And that is that basis of what I talk to everybody about. You know, if somebody says that they're suicidal, I listen to them. It doesn't matter to it doesn't matter if I feel what they're suicidal about is the, the a good or bad reason. It's their reason, and that's how I work with everybody that I work with. You know, whatever's going on with you is going on with you, and I believe it. Um, and so I believed this guy, and he was bless his heart. Um, so I said I worked in, in criminal justice for 20 years. I also worked in criminal justice with uh, veterans for 20 years. So I've heard literally everything that I could be called, I've been called already, and he was good at it. And that was probably my favorite part about these conversations with him because it doesn't phase me anymore. And so he would just go on these tirades and some of the staff at the hospital were like, how are you letting him talk to you like that? And I'd be like, what are you talking about? And they would say it, and I'd be like, oh yeah, no, like that doesn't have anything to do with this, you know? And so that always cracked me up. But having those pre 
uh, not having those preconceived notions of like, you can't call me this or you can't talk to me that way was really, really helpful. The York Hospital does an amazing job working with their crisis workers. It's the only hospital I've worked at, so I'm not saying any other hospital doesn't, but York does an amazing job. They listen to the crisis workers, they take our assessments really seriously, and they listen to our reasons that we think that people should be hospitalized. And in this particular case, we had to reassess him for a few days in order to get him um, into a behavioral health hospital, and they listened every time that we thought that really he was gonna be in danger to himself if he was out in the community. Um, and so it was a really amazing collaboration there, and Oh, okay. And so, uh, and for me as a liaison, you know, having another professional listen and uh, take the information that I had been able to gather over this period of time uh, was very validating and just relieving for me. But for our uh, client that we worked with, it was it made all the difference to him. I mean, he wanted to be there, and that was the thing too. Um, even though. He ultimately uh, probably could have been there, maybe against his will, given his circumstance. He wanted to be there. And, um, and so I want if Shannon. If I could just interject for one second. Yep. And that, I did, Lacey did mention that we worked together. We worked together really closely on this case. She would call me and give me information, and having that outside information was very, very helpful. We absolutely could have blue papered him if it was necessary, but he did choose to stay because we were able to make him feel safe and comforted. If I remember correctly, the very first thing he said when he started talking to me was, I can't talk to you, I'm hungry. And I was like, okay, here's some food. You know, like that really, really easy thing to fix. And um, I think that that really helped with the conversation. He certainly felt um, validated. And so Eric had mentioned that about 75% of referrals come by way of law enforcement. And that is one reason that Options has been partnered with law enforcement. And uh, in my experience in the two and a half years, I could probably say without some stats in front of me that that number is absolutely true, just as far as even who I've been connected with in the community. And that has been very helpful, not only to connect with people, but to also be part of the police department and help educate them on new ways to deal with um, patients like this um, that they otherwise have never, don't know how, and we've traditionally just been um, arresting the problem away, and we're trying to change that culture. Uh, and so I want Shannon, she's going to talk a little bit about how, uh, as a liaison and the police department, we work together and kind of their role in that. Yeah, so um, for this specific client, he was a police co-response call that Lacey had responded to with the officers. Um, that's, like she said, probably how we meet most of our people. We get um, like follow-ups or referrals as well from the officers or from the local hospitals, but um, most of our clients come from police interactions. Um, for him also specifically, there is a lot of paranoia around police trying to kill him. So we did a lot of education around um, this, you know, what are some things that you can say that could trigger him and make him more fearful and less likely to work with us. Um, our officers are really, they, you know, they take everything in and they, they follow our guidance. It's wonderful. Um, and they learned how to work with him really well. So um, that was good. And then. Some of what Lacey had talked about with some of the other hospitals, we kind of partnered to um, build better relations in some of our local hospitals, and uh, I think we've done worked really hard to do that, and kind of a result of this case. So, um. and I would say one of the you know best examples of helping the officers work with him is because he was so paranoid about the police and very convinced that they were going to set him up to either just kill him or go down suicide by by cop, um, he felt very comfortable talking to them in front of their cameras. Mm -hmm. So if they were in a cruiser, it was talking to him in front of the cruiser where the camera could pick it up. That made him feel safe. When our department took on body cams, it was tell him your body cam is on. Um, and so that was just very helpful, um, coordinating this case and eventually, what this led to, um, unfortunately, at times, was incarceration. Uh, and this is kind of where Marsha comes in. You know, he gets incarcerated, and we brought Marsha in as the intensive case manager. She did exactly what she had said to meet with him. So I went down and met with him, and uh, I find out a little bit about his case, why he, why he's, what crimes he committed to, be, to come into the jail. Um, I find out who his defense attorney is. Um, 
I work with the attorneys and uh, we come up with a reentry plan uh, and, and with the courts. Uh, sometimes uh, with an individual like this uh, who has, you know, severe, prolonged mental health issues, um, they, it's still in the jail. Uh, oftentimes I'm called upon to uh, make referrals to our state hospitals. Um, and in this case, we did make a referral, but he also had bail conditions. When he first came in, when Lacey and I first, you know, first was involved, uh, he had bail conditions. So I had made a referral for him to get services at, at Riverview, and, um, but it was a waiting game. Is he gonna get the money to bail, or is he gonna go to Riverview? The first time, whoops, I'm losing my glasses here. The first time, he made bail. And so I think that then he went back out into the community and I think there was a lot more police involvement and options involvement and a lot of substance use, um, which it inevitably brought him back to the jail. This time we were able to get him more services and make outside referrals and he ended up at, he did end up at Riverview. And that's not an easy sell. And so collectively, we were able to even provide Riverview the information that they needed to, uh, to make the decision to take him. And he was there for about four months um, and came out into recovery living, did well for a little bit. Um, and we still had some slips. And that's when we brought Todd on, who is the community intensive case manager. He's been with OBH for about 27 years. So the amount of relationships that Todd came with, he just played such a pivotal role. So. Uh, after one more hospitalization, uh, after this, uh, we worked to, our Todd worked to get a referral into a PNMI level of care, which is really what this gentleman needed. Uh, and it still took quite a bit, and it took even a few months from there, but eventually we were able to get him to the level of care that he needed, and it was really because of this team and only because of this team that we were able to do that for him. And that's why this coordinated response has just been so pivotal to the work that Options does. Thank you. Thank you. So we've got about five minutes for any questions or comments from the audience. And I'd like to have both panels come up, uh, if you don't mind. There's microphones here and here. Or if you, if you speak from, from here, we could hear you. Hi. Um, Maybe somebody back there wouldn't. So my name is Lynn, long-term recovery myself. What are your thoughts about taking mobiles out into the community? I know during the winter it's going to be a little more challenging, but just being there, showing people that you are still advocating, you're still helping when they need it. I know it can't be everywhere all at once, you know, but into the bigger communities that in the area that like more people are at and more drug use there is and, and drinking and all that and uh, encampments, you know, just to show them that, hey, if I, I need to talk to somebody, I can't get them on the phone, because even I know that, <laughs> leave a message, we'll call you later, sometimes it's a week, you know? So I just wondering about the thoughts about a mobile unit at some point going out. Uh, I'll take that if that's okay. So I worked on uh, mobile units in Boston. There are some talks of mobile units coming to Bangor. There's a lot of plus and, mi plus and minuses to the mobile units. One of the minuses is you're kind of like, come on my dark, creepy van, if, even though you've never <laughs> met me. I promise you'll be fine. Um, so it's one of the downsides. The other downside, they're very expensive, um, and they can't get everywhere that we're trying to get to. So one of the pluses is it's like having a sign that's like, hey, we're here for you, come see us, which is great. So you're a little more visible. Um, and in the winter time, when you do have someone that needs wound care, it is warmer in the van than it is in the tent. So there's plus and minuses to them. And it's something that I know in Bangor, we're continuing to explore. Some of the community partners um, have uh, secured a van. Um, and now it's just a matter of using them and using them well. Right here. Ryan, uh, alcoholic addict. Um, I was just wondering how uh, options team like that starts and who um, 
how would you go about doing something like that? So how to get into options work specifically? Uh, so, I mean, for me specifically, I just, I saw this opening come up and it was, you know, for a clinician working with police department, I think if you would have asked me 10 years ago, no way uh, was that um, something that I even felt like I could do. Um, but it was really just by way of being connected with the position and, and how we've created the team is just a lot of community outreach. It's in the relationships that you build with others, um, getting out into the community, letting people know who we are, what we can do. Um, the services that we can provide and how we can help them. It's not just how they can help us do our work, it's how can options help them. Um, and so I would say if you are ever interested in a role like that, definitely moving forward with some sort of substance use education, certificate programs, working in the field, and even just checking out your local liaison and asking them questions and getting some more information in your area. Thank you. You're welcome. Right here. Hi, thanks. Um, my name is Anna Graham and I'm a, <clears throat> uh, sit on the Health and Human Services Committee, and I want to thank you for all that you do. Whenever we have things come before us, I always want to hear about boots on the ground. I'm a former nurse practitioner, and I really want to hear boots on the ground. So my question, and I wonder if we could talk to some of the, the, the to law enforcement individuals, is, you know, we, we know that many individuals who interact with you all um, are in crisis, in mental health crisis, and how, how, how you approach that, how you de-escalate that, um, and you know, engage, because not every department, not every sheriff's department um, has mental health professionals to be able to address that. So, um, and then one, uh, was mentioned suicide by a uh, police officer. And so I, I just kind of, maybe a, a situation where you found this really working. Are you asking specifically how to de-escalate uh, a situation Does where it, it's like mental health? Yeah, and, and, and how, you know, how law enforcement and mental health really engage and make a difference for, for a client? For so I can just tell you where I work at the Bangor Police Department. Again, my name is Officer Alvarado. At the Bangor Police Department, we have two mental health liaison from Acadia that works along with us. Uh, it so happens that I'm fortunate to have one of them ride at me like most days when I'm working. Um, it's good to have them with us because um, in our community, as options know, we have a lot of people that suffer from substance abuse disorder, also suffer from mental health. So most of the time, if I go there and I notice that it is a mental health situation and I have the Arcade liaison with me, I will have them try to de-escalate the situation first before I get involved. A lot of time when they see not a uniform officer talking to them, they tend to be more relaxed. Sometimes it's not the case. Sometimes the officer is the one that relaxed them. But vice versa, I think it's good because we both help each other, we feed, we feed off each other. Okay. I don't think we have any more time. We're right at 2.30, so thanks very much for joining us for this hour. We really appreciate your time and attention. And go back to your communities and answer those questions in the brochure. Great job.